Hello guys, this is Adip. Welcome to my channel Movement Science, where I simplify biomechanics with Joe. So if you are new to this channel, consider subscribing. Also check me out on Instagram, where I post pictures of my notes, and the reference time for all the topics that I'm going to cover will be mentioned down in the description. So check that out, and let's get started. In this video, we are going to talk about the wrist kinematics part two, where we'll be discussing about the radial and ulnar deviation, right? So last video, I talked about flexion extension, and this video will be about radial and ulnar deviation. And with that, we will finish the kinematics of the wrist joint. One thing that I did not cover in the kinematics was the range of motion, the normal range of motion that is seen at the wrist joint. So I thought I'll cover that too. So at flexion of wrist joint is around 90 degrees over here. Extension is around 80 degrees. Okay, radial deviation is around 20 degrees, and ulnar deviation is around 40 degrees. So those are the normal range of motion. And then functionally, what we actually use in our day-to-day -day life comes to around flexion of 54 degrees, extension of 60 degrees, radial deviation of 17 degrees, and ulnar deviation of 40 degrees. So these are the functional ranges that we use in our day-to-day -day life. So keeping that aside, let's move on to the main topic that is the radial and ulnar deviation. So we will discuss about how the movement occurs, how the bones move when the radial and ulnar deviation happens. And then we will see how flexion and extension with radial and ulnar deviation, what happens at the wrist joint, right? So let's start with the topic. So starting with the kinematics. It is all about the proximal carpal bones, okay? So over here in radial and ulnar deviation, what happens is there is something called as the reciprocal motion, okay, reciprocal motion of the proximal carpal bones that is seen. So basically when your hand is going for radial deviation, your carpal bones will go towards the ulnar side. And when it's going for ulnar deviation, your proximal carpals, okay, proximal carpals will go for on the radial side. So that is the basic movement that we need to understand and that's why if we want to increase the radial deviation will give a ulnar glide correct and if we want to increase the ulnar deviation we give a radial glide when we are mobilizing the wrist so that is what is seen over here in the kinematics so let's go to the radial deviation first so in radial deviation the distal carpals will move along with metacarpals so similar how it was happening in flexion extension right when extension was happening the metacarpals and the distal carpals were moving together. So the similar thing will happen in radial deviation. Your distal carpals, okay, these distal carpals will move along with your metacarpals in the radial direction because radial deviation is happening, right? And what will happen to the proximal carpals? The proximal carpals will slide ulnarly on the radius. So this is your radius and all the proximal carpals, you can see this is the ulnar side and this is the radial side, okay? okay. So when radial deviation is happening, all the distal carpals will move in the radial direction and proximal will move in the ulnar direction. They will slide, okay? And then the proximal carpals also go for flexion. That is, you can see over here, I have written flexion. The scaphoid specifically goes for flexion, whereas the distal carpals go for extension, okay? So flexion would be, they'll be coming towards this side and extension would be, they will they'll come upward, correct? So that is the movement that is seen. So proximal carpals will go for the exact opposite, ulnar and flexion movement, and the radial and the distal carpals will go for radial and extension, right? Radial movement and extension. So that exact opposite movement will be happening. That's why it's called as a reciprocal motion, correct? The magnitude of the motion that happens in these carpal bones can vary based on your ligament laxity. So based on how taut your ligaments are, the movement of the bones will vary and normally what is seen is in female the ligament laxity is slightly more compared to males so the movement will vary accordingly right and the exactly opposite motion will happen in your ulnar deviation that is now let us guess when ulnar deviation is happening all the distal carpal bones will move in the ulnar direction correct and they will go for flexion compared to your proximal which will move into the radial and extension correct that's how the movement will occur 
Now going on to the combined movements that is we see that there is high range of motion when your wrist is in neutral position okay. So if I keep my wrist in neutral I can see ulnar and radial deviation happens a lot more correct compared to if I take it in extension there is very little movement that happens in radial and ulnar direction and you compare it to flexion there is hardly any movement that I can do. So that's what I mentioned over here. So range of motion is the highest when your wrist is in neutral. Range of motion for radial and ulnar deviation, okay? And when your wrist is in extended position, what happens? Your all bones come together, right? When extension is happening, it's a close pack position, you remember? So all the bones are coming together. Hence, there is very little space for your carpals to move and cause that radial and ulnar deviation, the sliding and gliding that was happening becomes very less. So when extended, that is in close pack position, all the bones are locked which will reduce your range of motion of radial and ulnar deviation. Whereas when you are flexed that is when your wrist is in flex position what will happen it will be in exactly opposite it will be in a loose pack position okay all the bones will be just spread apart that's called as bones will be splayed and there will be hardly any movement right no movement at the wrist joint you can see there is hardly any radial and ulnar deviation that you can do. So that is what is seen when it comes to kinematics of radial and ulnar deviation. Apart from this, another small point I wanted to add is when you go for extension and ulnar deviation, this is when the there is maximum contact between the SL that is scaffold and lunate. Okay, scaffold and lunate there is like a good contact, hence it forms like a good stable base for your hand to move, right? All the fingers and the distal part to move. So hence during surgeries, surgeons put your hand into extension and ulnar deviation if we want to fuse the wrist joint. When the wrist joint has to be fused, the it will be it will be fused in 20 degrees of extension and 10 degrees of ulnar deviation, which provides you with a stable base and optimal functional position if it has to be fused and there is no option. So now to summarize the topic, what did we see? We saw that the radial and ulnar deviation the movement is much more complex but it is slightly less variable because the variation only depends on your ligament laxity correct we saw that during radial deviation distal carpals will move towards and the proximal carpals will move uh, away from the movement that is happening so that is the reciprocal motion right and then we saw the normal range of motion and then how flexion and extension changes your movement at radial and ulnar deviation right so with that we finish off this topic that's all for today guys thank you for watching if you like my content please like share and subscribe to the channel it will really help me out and thank you for watching